The following is a Shaw Public Affairs presentation. Constituency Report is produced as a public service by members of the BC Legislature through the facilities of Shaw TV. Hello and welcome to Constituency Report on Shaw TV. My name is Edward May and with us in the studio today is Mike Farnworth, new Democrat MLA for Port Coquitlam and official opposition critic for health. Welcome to the show, Mike. My pleasure, Ed. Now let's start with uh, talking about the session because mm -hmm. the House is in session mm -hmm. and uh, let's start with the length of the session. Usually the spring session is, is very long. Yeah, normally it should be uh, a fairly lengthy session, mm -hmm. but uh, because of the issues around uh, leadership races that have been taking place along the federal election, mm -hmm. but uh, primarily the leadership races in both parties, the session has been truncated uh, quite a bit and it's a lot shorter than it normally would be. So we're trying to put uh, an awful lot of work into a very short space of time. Mm -hmm. And so uh, legislation and estimates are, uh, you know, we don't have the time that we normally do. And it's particularly disappointing considering that we've been, you know, it's been 10 months mm -hmm. uh, since the last real sitting. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of work to take place in a very short amount of time. And when you couple that with the, uh, the possibility of an election in the fall, uh, there's not much time to get the things that done that we need to get done. Mm -hmm. Now, why wouldn't the BC Liberals uh, extend into the into the summer a bit more? Well, that's one of the uh, that's a really interesting question. It's a good question because we've been saying, look, you know, the people expect us to work, the public expects us to be working. So I know that the calendar says we're supposed to end the second of June, but there's no real reason why we can't extend the session um, to the end of June so that we can deal with some of the legislation that we've got before us. Mm -hmm. There's been some, uh, you know, the government initially said they were looking at about seven bills that they weren't particularly controversial in nature. And now we're seeing closer to 15 bills, and some of them are, uh, you know, are controversial, need to have a, a great deal of, of scrutiny. Uh, two, for example, uh, one is the treaty with the Yale First Nation, mm -hmm. which is a quite a comprehensive uh, agreement, and I think it deserves to be scrutinized. That's our that's our job, mm -hmm. and the time we have isn't necessarily going to allow that to take place. And I think that's uh, that's concerning to us from the point of view of the opposition. The other is a bill uh, that we're likely to be debating, and that's around the new care cards, mm -hmm. and new care cards being introduced to combat fraud, which is great, you know, and it sounds good, but the problem is, is from the moment that the government has introduced and said they were going to make these changes, and they said that the initial cost was going to be $10 million, two hours later that went to $28 million a year for five years. Uh, then the figures that they were using for saying what the estimated savings were have changed from anywhere from 50 to $100 million and then saying the amount of fraud in the province is $240 million, and then yesterday, or they said, well, it could be 300 There's no business plan. We've asked for a business plan. These kinds of changes deserve to be scrutinized properly, and uh, the fact that we're having such a short session isn't going to allow that to take place, and I think that's a real, uh, a real problem. Mm -hmm. Now, another part of, of the, the session in the legislature is also the, the debate about the budget and mm -hmm. about the, the details of the ministry spending. Do you think there's going to be enough time to, to get all that done in the session? Again, um, we, will, you know, we will deal with the, uh, the spending estimates of each, of each ministry. Mm -hmm. So when the government tables a budget, what happens is after that we go into a committee system, a mm -hmm. committee stage, where the, uh, the spending for each ministry is debated and scrutinized. Normally, health care, for which I'm critic, will normally get a, a full week allocated mm -hmm. to it. Right now, we're getting 13 hours. Uh, that's mm -hmm. considerably less time than what we would normally get. And so it makes it a real challenge to be able to go through all the different aspects of, of health care uh, to see where government is spending and where they're not spending and to get thorough and detailed explanations of what's taking place. So I'd like to see us extend the session. Um, to the end of June, that would allow proper time for debate. It would allow for proper time um, scrutiny of the financial estimates, and that's what the public expects us to be doing. And so uh, we've been uh, asking for that, but uh, somehow I don't think that that's going to happen. Uh -huh. So of course, without knowing what's going to happen mm -hmm. at the end of this session, what's happened in previous sessions when when that time gets run out and the BC Liberals have refused to sort of extend and there's still stuff on the paper? Well. As I said earlier, we have a calendar. We have a spring mm -hmm. session, a fall session. This government's been really reluctant to, you know, 
use a fall session to look at legislation. Mm -hmm. And so what they have been doing, traditionally been doing in the past, is to say, okay, we'll have a little session in the fall of a week as opposed to the six weeks that we should have. And or they'll come at the end of June and they'll say, well, you know, we don't want to be deb debating any legislation in the fall, so we're going to invoke closure. Mm -hmm. And what that does is the government brings forward a motion and it rams through, passes all the bills that are still have not been dealt with, that are still on the order paper, that are still waiting to be debated and voted on, and basically you pass them in one foul swoop. And uh, that's it, end of debate. And the government uses its majority to steamroll over the opposition, to steamroll over scrutiny of, uh, of important legislation. Mm -hmm. And I think that does a disservice. That's not how our system is supposed to work. But uh, that may well be what happens again in this session and I think that that would be uh, a real travesty if, for example, a treaty were supposed were uh, were passed by the use of closure, and so that there was very little time to comment on it or to uh, debate and scrutinize uh, clause by clause uh, the issues that are raised uh, with the with the treaty with the Yale First Nation. Mm -hmm. Now the last. Uh big part that everybody knows this legislative session for is question period, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, what have some of the issues been the raised in question period this session? Well, there have been a lot of issues. As we know, um, you know, HST continues to be important for many British Columbians. Mm -hmm. Health care has been important. Issues around education ha have been raised. Issues around uh, long-term care, um, environmental issues. All the issues that people are are concerned about, and you know, from the broad base to the very specific types of question we've been asking, we've been raising, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're not going to see an extended session, for example, because I don't think the government wants to face that scrutiny in question period. It is going to be really interesting because we are going to see the new premier, uh, Premier Clark, in the House for the first time, I think, in the. Um, that first week of June, right? Uh, and so I'm looking forward, and I think uh, our caucus is looking forward to being able to put questions directly to her, because she's not been in the House because she, you know, only just got elected, and, and the, the results have not yet been certified. It's, um, you know, you've got asking questions to ministers, which is great, mm -hmm. um, and that's what's supposed to happen. But at the same time, the fact of the matter is the head of government, the the um, the premier, has not been in there, and so this will be an opportunity for us to ask questions directly of the Premier, and so I think all of us are looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a very, very few days that she'll be there. Do you think the, the fact that she will be there, that, that that's going to determine whether they extend or may play a part in whether they extend the session? Um, I think they've already made their decision around what they want to do in the session. Mm -hmm. I think the Premier wants to be there basically for, in essence, to, to show that, yes, I'm here, and to do a few <laughs> days, uh, you know, sparring with the opposition, photo op, and then get mm -hmm. out of the legislature so that there's no requirement to face a daily day scrutiny. Mm -hmm. And to go, what I expect will be uh, on the campaign trail for most of the summer, culminating with a, a provincial election in the fall. Particularly, uh, but, but the I think big caveat is going to be what happens with the HST referendum and mm -hmm. how that plays out. But certainly, the every indication that we have here in Victoria uh, seems to be that there's going to be an election uh, in September or October. Uh, it's certainly the assumption that I'm working on. And so uh, it'll be interesting to have her, the, the new Premier, in the House so we can pepper her with, uh, you know, ask questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, I don't expect us to be sitting much past uh, the 2nd of June. I think the decision has already been made. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the new B.C. Liberal uh, mm -hmm. leader and Premier of the province. Now, she, uh, when she won the leadership, she talked about change and it beginning now. Uh, how much uh, credit do you give to the notion that she represents change? Well. I don't believe this is a significant change from what we've seen for the last 10 years with the BC Liberals. I mean, we've yet to see, I think, any real substantive uh, change from the new Premier. Mm -hmm. I know that there was an announcement made on health care, uh, the, but the bulk of the money was a um, was reallocation of existing funds, so mm -hmm. it wasn't new money, and it was sort of a re-announcing of programs that are already in place. Right. Um, I've not seen seen that change yet. I mean, we've seen issues, questions around the HST. We're still waiting to see what it is she finally wants to do with the uh, mm -hmm. with the HST during her own leadership campaign. You know, she expressed a number of uh, different positions that led to criticism from other leadership candidates mm -hmm. within the BC Liberal Party. Uh, so I'm I'm not expecting to see significant difference between um, how this government operates uh, under Premier Clark as to how it did under Premier Campbell. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but we're just going to have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. Now, and she also played a very big part of that first Campbell term <laughs> as well. Doesn't that wouldn't that suggest that she's is sort of 
part of the old well, I think I think that's again that's a good question. I think what it speaks to is is that uh, yes, she was very much part of the uh, the original Campbell mm -hmm. government uh, that made some of the most draconian cuts to uh, to children and families, for example. So when she now talks about families first, you got to contrast that with the record of her as uh, children and families minister, which was I think pretty uh, you know damning in terms of the cuts that took place. The same mm -hmm. with education where I think uh, at that time when she was Minister of Education, she developed a reputation of pitting parents against trustees, against teachers, uh, being very divisive. Mm -hmm. And so, it'll, you know, that's, that's, the, that's our experience, and I think that's the experience for many of British Columbians. And again, so it comes down to why change, I don't think, I I is what we're going to see. Another example was uh, health care spending. Uh, you know, during her leadership campaign, she says she wanted to tie it to the rate of economic growth. Healthcare spending has been increasing significantly, much higher than the rate of economic growth for quite some time, and will probably well into the future. It's a fact, and so you know when a statement like that was made, it sh I think it showed a real lack of understanding of how our healthcare system uh, functions, the, the pressures it faces, not just here in BC but right across the country, and it, that uh, feeling was you know echoed by other uh, leadership candidates in in her own leadership campaign. You know, people like George Abbott and Mike DeYoung and Kevin Falcon, all, I mean, Falcon and Abbott, who've been health care ministers, just said, you know, you, that really reflects, I think, a lack of understanding of how our health care system works. So um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens over the next few months, and I think it's going to be a very interesting election campaign. Mm -hmm. I have a question about her style. Now, mm -hmm. her uh, Kevin Falcon, uh, who ran against her for the mm -hmm. B.C. Liberal leadership, now one of her cabinet ministers, mm -hmm. Uh, made a reference during the leadership called uh, called her management approach style uh, ready a, f a ready fire aim approach. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could talk about that and, and what what he's suggesting by that. Well, I think what um, Kevin Falcon was saying at the time was what many people have uh, have been saying about you know her as being government, which is it's very much about photo ops. It's very much about um, you know getting on the six o'clock news mm -hmm. as opposed to the hard business of governing and I think that's one of the reasons why we'll see an early election mm -hmm. I think what uh, the new premier is trying to do is to to sort of create some sustained hype um, that uh, she's different and the fact is is that I think the longer you wait the harder that becomes to sustain and that over time I think you'll see the true nature of, um, of Premier Clark and I think one of the, the, the issues that she's going to have to deal with and has, I think, been reluctant to deal with so far is the issue of actually governing a province, right. making decisions. Because once you start making decisions, then you start alienating people, particularly when you've got a government that's been in power uh, for as long as this one has, which is, you know, over 10 years now. And so I think that, um, you know, she has some real challenges, and I haven't seen anything yet that demonstrates that, uh, you know, that... Um, Kevin Falcon's comments of uh, ready, fire, aim <laughs> are, uh, you know, pretty close to the mark. Mm -hmm. Now, in a couple of minutes, we have to take a break. We'll be displaying contact information of where you can reach Mike Farnworth in his constituency office, so now's the time to grab a pen. But before the break, of course, uh, the New Democrats also have a new leader in mm -hmm. Adrian Dix, mm -hmm. and, and as you mentioned, there, there is likely to be an election before mm -hmm. the year is up. What do you think th are going to be the stark differences between the two parties and it, when going into the next election? Well, I think uh, Adrian will present a quite a contrast with uh, with Christie. I think you know one of Adrian's strengths is that he is very much policy detail oriented, mm -hmm. and I think that that's something that will contrast quite starkly with mm -hmm. uh, with Christie Clark. Um, I think that uh, he will present a, a vision that you know differentiates us from the Liberals and from uh, Premier Clark and so I think voters are going to go into the election campaign uh, with a with a real with a with a clear choice I think it's going to be a real interesting campaign I know Adrian will be will work very hard and that uh, he's going to be bright and determined and I think the Liberals uh, underestimate him at, at their peril mm -hmm. and what about at the at the just the party level as well and the le and the issue of trust Oh, I think that, uh, you know, there's some real questions with this government around issues of trust. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen it with, uh, you know, the BC Rail deal. We've seen it when they said, oh, we will honor contracts, and when they got elected, they tore those contracts up. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen it on the HST. There'll be no HST, then there is the HST. 
Uh, we've seen it when, uh, you know, there's a $640 million tax cut one week and then two weeks later it's <laughs> taken right. back. So I think trust is a real problem for this government and I think that that's going to be very much uh, one of the key issues in the next election campaign. And, uh, you know, I think the people of British Columbia are, will, have a, will have a real choice. Great. We have to take a short break. Please stay with us as we continue our conversation with Mike Farnworth, new Democrat MLA for Port Coquitlam. Hello and welcome back to Constituency Report on Shaw TV. My name is Edward May and again today we're speaking with Mike Farnworth, new Democrat MLA for Port Coquitlam and official opposition critic for health. Now, uh, Mike, before, but in the first half of the break, you mentioned a couple issues I'd like to go back to. One of the things you mentioned, of course, that came up in question period time and time again is the HST. Mm -hmm. And we've got this upcoming referendum. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to start with uh, the big ad campaign that the BC Liberals have now, the government has put out on taxpayers' money. They're trying to position themselves as sort of neutral on this issue. How much do you uh, buy that, or how much do you think voters will buy it? I don't think voters will buy it at all. <laughs> I mean, the government is anything but neutral on the issue. I mean, they've mm -hmm. made it a centerpiece of their economic, uh, you know, platform, mm -hmm. and the premier has been very, you know, supportive of it, both when she was an on-air talk show host, mm -hmm. um, as well as since becoming premier. And so the Liberals are anything but disinterested on the issue. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be a great deal of money spent, not just by, you know, the official campaigns for the anti-HST group and the pro-HST group, mm -hmm. but government will be running ads, and you're already seeing them on, mm -hmm. on TV right now, the stick figures. Uh, so there'll be an amazing amount of advertising there using, you know, the public's own money to tell the public, in essence, what's good for them. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to see, I think, the beneficiaries of the tax will be spending significant amount of money to uh, tell people why they, they should support it. So the government's anything but disinterested and you're going to see a lot of money thrown at it between now and, uh, you know, the time that uh, we vote on it. Mm -hmm. So people will be receiving their ballots roughly mid-June. Yeah. Mid They'll yeah. have until about mid-July to get them back out. When somebody's actually got the ballot in front of them and they're about to make a tick, what do you think some of the issues are that people are really going to think about when they're casting that vote? Well, I think people are going to look at it from the perspective of, you know, was the government honest? Mm -hmm. uh, is it impacting me? Uh, how does this impact me? And I think most people have already had an experience with the tax. They understand the impact on them, you know, what it means to them and their family. Uh, you know, if they're doing a home renovation, they'll certainly uh, notice an impact. Uh, for example. So I, I think people are going to sit down, they're going to look at it from their own perspective, and then they'll make a vote. And everything I've seen right now tells me that uh, they're not going to be voting for it. And I think that'll be a real challenge for the government. Mm -hmm. Now, another issue you mentioned in the first half was, was this care card uh, mm -hmm. initiative that's happening right now. And I was wondering if you could give us a little bit more of a background about why it's happening and, and, and why it, what's going well, on Well, what the government's claiming is that there is fraud in the health care system, that uh, there are 9 million care cards out there in a province with only 4.5 million people. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that there's issues of fraud. I know last year from the government's own figures that there were 399 cases of fraud investigated. I think 374 were found to be fraudulent. That's about a 94% rate. But it involved about just under a million dollars. We should be cracking down on fraud. I mean, after all, we, you know, Sarah Palin herself admitted to crossing the border into the Yukon. <laughs> you know, she's quite content to scam our health care system mm -hmm. uh, and to, you know, to get, quote, free health care, as, as she referred to it as. But I think the, um, you know, the, uh, the question for many British Columbians is they want to make sure the health care dollars are going to British Columbians and to Canadians, mm -hmm. uh, not from people coming outside uh, BC, outside of Canada to, to get our health care system. So I think everyone's in favor of ensuring that, uh, you know, we try and eliminate fraud and crack down on fraud. I think some of the questions that we have, though, are, you know, 
the government's going to spend $150 million on new care cards, then put together and show the public a business case as to why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Show us how much fraud is taking place. Show us where you think it's taking place. How long have you known about it? Be clear on what it's going to cost and what it will accomplish. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, when you make an announcement at, um, in the afternoon that it's costing $10 million, and then two hours later you're saying, well, no, actually it's costing 150 because it's $28 million over five years, that raises all kinds of questions, particularly given the record we've seen with this government on issues such as the roof on BC Place, for example, where you start off with one set of costs and it rapidly escalates to another set of costs. And likewise, you know, th th we're not going to do the HST, then we're going to do the HST. Here's what the budget was before the last election, $495 million deficit. And then it's a $3 billion deficit you know, mm -hmm. uh, shortly after the election. So I think the government has an obligation to provide, you know, more information than they have done so that people can can see that one, the solution that the government's proposing is in fact the right solution. Uh, and I think that, that that's key. The other issue is there, there, there are, um, I think, some real valid privacy questions that need to be uh, answered by the government. You know, this has been talked about as being linked to your driver's license, which of course Motor Vehicle Branch and ICBC have mm -hmm. uh, access to. And so, the, you know, again, so one of the questions that has already had, does uh, ICBC be able to access your health records, for mm -hmm. example? Uh, I think that's a very good question. And, and questions like that the government needs to be prepared to answer. So while I say, you know, yes, that uh, we're in favor of cracking down on fraud and we should be doing that, I also want to know, okay, how much are you spending? Why are you spending it? What's it going to accomplish? And, and what's the nature of the problem that you're trying to deal with? So, uh, and we have not heard answers uh, from the government on to those questions, and I think that that's a big mistake. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've found very interesting is the minister keeps referring to it as uh, uh, being option that somebody can have the option of having the cards, uh, or that it's their option. What happens, uh, has, the, have the, has he been clear about what happens if you don't opt in? <laughs> well, again, there's a, as I said, there's a whole mess of questions around mm -hmm. this. So, um, N numerous questions that we've got to be answered, and that's one of the reasons why I'm looking forward to any legislation that you know we end up debating in the mm -hmm. House on this, to being able to you know talk about it in the principle of it, but also to scrutinize it in terms of the committee stage, where we go clause by clause through right. the legislation to see what each clause is supposed to mean and its impact. And so I I am looking forward to that, which is again why I hope we don't have closure invoked and the government just passes it and there's no debate taking place because issues like this deserve to be scrutinized because the public has questions and they rightly deserve answers to those questions. Mm -hmm. Now another issue that, that pertains to your file is, is the health accord mm -hmm. and its expiry that's looming down the road. However, uh, it, this election it may be, do you think that the, the, the agreement with the federal government will play a part in this election? Absolutely. I think, you know, our health care system, our publicly funded health care system, is funded, you know, you've got health care premiums which have gone up under mm -hmm. significantly under this government. You have, uh, you know, general revenue which su supplies a lot of the funds for our, for our health care system. But we also receive transfers from the federal government from Ottawa. In the 1990s, we didn't. Ottawa, at that time, balanced the federal budget on the backs of the provinces by cutting and gutting programs that saw health transfers to the provinces mm -hmm. from Ottawa, virtually eliminated. The result was, you know, some really painful times uh, in the provinces. Subsequently, a uh, health accord was negotiated which saw health transfers from Ottawa restored to, uh, uh, I think, a very significant level and increased 6% a year. That agreement expires in 2014. The federal government says they want to, to keep it in place, but I think what's crucial is that we have to have leadership from the province. We have to have leadership from the provinces in terms of ensuring that that agreement is renewed, that those health transfers continue to flow to support our health care system and to provide the services that British Columbians need and that British Columbians expect when it comes to health care. Because if we don't, the impact on our health care system will be significant. And it will mean real cuts in key areas, you know, and I think that uh, that that would be just an absolute travesty uh, to my constituents and people right across the province. So for me, renewing the health accord is a very important piece of government policy. I think it's something that we need to show leadership on. I think it's something that British Columbia is uniquely positioned to be uh, playing an important role in, uh, you know, working with and pressuring Ottawa to ensure that you know that they know that one, this is a priority for the province and other provinces, but also to work you know, with Alberta, Ontario, Quebec, Saskatchewan, Maritimes, 
uh, to make sure that this agreement is renewed and that uh, those transfers continue to flow uh, to, uh, to BC and other provinces so that we can you know, use that money uh, for our health care system. Mm -hmm. Now, we're getting close to the end of the show, but I understand you brought some photos with you. I want to make sure that we have enough time for them. And so I wonder if you could walk us through these. Uh, this is at a rally uh, around the Schoenborn case, which was something I spoke at, which was, uh, I think, a real uh, issue of concern to people in my riding about uh, Mr. Schoenborn, who mm -hmm. did the brutal murder um, of uh, three kids and then is at the uh, psychiatric uh, forensic uh, unit in, uh, at Colony Farm. I was going to be given escorted uh, day passes and there was just a real outrage in the community, particularly as it was announced on the, the anniversary of, the trend of, of, of those murders. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a uh, meeting uh, with the Taiwanese uh, community, as you know, in, in my riding in mm -hmm. Port Coquitlam, I have a fairly significant uh, Taiwanese uh, community, so this was and then this is uh, at an event in, uh, in Port Coquitlam. My office tries to uh, participate in as many community mm -hmm. events in Poco as possible. And uh, this is another one of them where we have the emergency field day uh, with our local uh, um, emergency uh, preparedness in terms of the radios, um, shortwave radios. So Excellent. Lots going on. Well, sadly, we've run out of time, but I want to thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. And thank you for watching Constituency Report on Shaw TV. Again, we were speaking with Mike Farnworth, New Democrat MLA for Port Coquitlam.